Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast of a bunch of writers sitting around drinking tasty beverages and talking about writing, publishing, and the whole creative process. We do not censor ourselves, so consider us PG-13. Your hosts today are the fabulous Deirdre Schween, John Schmidt, and me, Jeannie Warner. This is episode 119, interview with K.L. Gallagher. Welcome, K.L. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Oh, I was so delighted. I have to, I'm going to tell everybody the story of how we found you. You guys have all probably established out there in listener land that I play hockey. And <laughs> my faithful websiter here, Deirdre, also plays hockey with me on the Stormtroopers. We have played in the t- past a team called Pandora from out of Sacramento and got on their mailing list because all hockey girls are awesome. And I got this neat thing saying, hey, Pandora friends, we have a new book that's been put out by Kale Gallagher. And I'm like, I want to interview her. <laughs> so welcome. This is so exciting. Hockey girl novel, writes a novel, your very first novel. Tell us about the novel. Oh, wow. It's a, it is definitely a labor of love. Uh, without giving too much away, because it's out soon. Uh, it involves a, an, an attorney who was an up and coming shining star back in California, kind of sounds a little bit like, uh, I don't know, the writer maybe, uh, at any event, she, uh, a, a really serious thing happened to her and she was forced to relocate all the way across the country to New York and basically start over. She threw herself into her work, wants nothing to do with love. And she ends up going to a hockey game one day and seeing the first ever female NHL head coach behind the bench of the New York Islanders. Sweet. Yeah. Lord for that real in real. Well, there are a few actually. Assistants, yes. Yes, there's but head coach, that would be sweet. Oh, she was the head coach. Right. I know. It's gonna be great. Yeah. <laughs> so they end up uh, you know, long story short, they end up falling for each other. That's only half the story. And uh, then uh, the, the inevitable bumps in the road come in, and that's where it starts getting really good. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. Wait. So this is a hockey romance? Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Oh, romance. my God. Uh, we need 20 copies stat. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to buy them for all of my team. It's very important. Oh. I, I, I fully endorse that. I fully endorse that. Absolutely. So, good author. <laughs> now, I'm just going to say as we say three, t- four times through this, it's called hat trick. Tell the people at home who don't love hockey the way we do what a hat trick is and what is the symbolism of naming it that for the book? Sure, a hat trick is when you score three goals in a game. And in here, it's space, if you combine the two women who have each had their own loss of love, can they hit that hat trick with each other? Nice. Aww. Yeah, that, <laughs> the, the, um, without giving too much away, this, the sequel will be Snapshot Genie, so I'm sure you'll appreciate that as well. Excellent, excellent. My, my question was, is this a regular hat trick or are we talking a Gordie Howe hat trick? <laughs> well, well, if I was playing, it might be a Gordie. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. Uh, tell but it's tell a regular the people what a Gordie Howe hat trick is for, the again, the non-hockey fans out there. A Gordie is a goal and assist in a fight in one yeah. game. <laughs> Uh, women don't typically have Gordies in, in our sport, but I've been known to drop them a couple times if if they mess with my teammates a little bit too much. So uh, it, it does happen. Oh, my, my friend uh, Kat, who we referred to after as Vader for being our very first goal, uh, our very first ever goalie down in Vegas, told a, a beautiful story once of how this guy on the other team, because she plays a co-ed, kept pressing her and pressing her. And finally, he shoved her once. So she threw down her gloves and her stick and she started just wailing on him. <laughs> and her defense sighed and started skating towards the sin bin. <laughs> like, I definitely have my stories of uh, if you that around been, rink, it's That should have been you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you come across the idea of writing this? How did you get what, sucked what into it? What drove you to it? Well, it was actually, uh, I stumbled onto this. I, I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for close to 15 years. And so I write for a living. I've never thought I could write something fun. And I could tell you writing law briefs is not the most fun thing to do, but it's very clinical. So my writing has always been very clinical. Never gave it a chance. But the lesbic community is pretty small. And uh, it actually saved me. 
back in 2016, I was incredibly depressed after the election occurred and I needed something different. But every book that I've ever read is always a man and a woman. I found one and I, I absolutely fell in love with it. It's called uh, And Playing the Role of Herself by Kay Elaine. <laughs> and I, I saw me. I saw me for the first time. And so then I ended up reading 300 books in the last three years. And I engaged a lot with the authors. Well, one of our, our authors who also engages with us, she needed a, she needs a, a medical procedure done and her insurance wouldn't cover it. So I just wanted to give back. So I, I, au- there was an auction going with a bunch of the authors. They just donated a ton of things, books, their time, editing, and, and several of them had a, a character you can name. So I bid about a thousand bucks all the way across the board and I won the one with Ali Spooner. It was just to name a character. Well, I've done that before. So all I expected was just to give the name, mm-hmm. but she came back and said, can you give me some background too? And oh, oh she wanted God. you to create a character. <laughs> yeah. And she goes, and she just wanted to kind of know where I was coming from. And right. every single book I've never written, every character just came pounding to the forefront of my head. It was like somebody let the sheep everywhere and no one can corral them. Mm-hmm. And so I just gave her a little background on Alex Hawthorne, the lawyer. She said, this is awesome. Why don't you write it? And I said, because I don't know how to write. She goes, aren't you a lawyer? <laughs> like, Jesus. Oh, shit. Yes, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> and I would just, you know, every single thing I could say, I don't want to do it because I would, I'm just scared. I was scared. I'm scared of being rejected in a variety of ways. And she said, you know what? I'll write it with you. And she was serious there. It, she goes, I'll take the first chapter, wrote the first one. If, if I didn't like it, we can just move on. She would just do it. I loved it. And I really wanted to write after that. And here we are. <laughs> so rather than putting you in, uh, rather than putting your character in, she made you write the book. <laughs> Not only did she, she didn't make me write the book. I, I'll put it this way. She gave me the incredible opportunity to kick the shit out of one of my bucket lists that's been there since God was a boy. So uh, I, I took it and we alternated chapters for a while. Um, she was, she was doing Alex and I was doing Janelle. That's kind of how it started going. But about halfway through the book, I just kind of just went, wow, I've got so much story to tell right now. And she knew this was my story. So I said, can I write the next chapter? And then she read it. Can I write the next chapter? She read it. She goes, you know what? If you want to go, just go. Go until you can't anymore. Well, can't anymore was the epilogue. So it was all done. (laughs) (laughs) So that's beautiful. She's she's amazing. She's an amazing human being. She's had a lot of loss over the last uh, few weeks. She lost her wife of, I think it was close to 26 years. And Is, is this the Ali Spooner who wrote Cowgirl Up? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Allie Spooner had, and by the way, when we were writing this book, I'm thinking we're going fast. She wrote like three books. <laughs> the time we started, the time so I got done. For every author. You know, we have a whole bunch of them out there that we love and yet secretly despise them all at the same time for four novels a year. Really? <laughs> right? It's not fair. I, so, I'm in the end, tell the truth now. How long from first chapter to epilogue did it take you it took us from a, it was about mid-july when we started and i July what year uh, last year sorry 2020 the, the the year that time forgot <laughs> oh so 14 and, uh, years ago so i'm hearing yeah. 14 years ago you four score on seven years ago which was 2020 <laughs> and uh, we were finished in i think it was around april yeah around my birthday we were done so it, it, we had to get it done by like mid-April to get it on track for editing um, and release on October 1st. Right. That's excellent. You it's keep fun. that timeline up, you'll be doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. And I, I have this thing, like many people tell you, you know, you got to write every day. And when we were doing this book, uh, I'm trying to write another book on the side. And I put so much pressure on myself to write 500 to f- to 1,000 words every day that I lost all of all my momentum weirdly Mm -hmm. and so i I tried not to fall into a trap of being forced to do what other people do and go back to what works for me because writing the law stuff and then switching back to writing stuff that's fun it's like my brain has to like chill out for a couple hours and by that time it's like nine o'clock at night and i don't want to write so I, i really try to just temper my expectations to make sure the product is good not just the output 
Right. And I, I often find when I'm going back to projects that I need to read back a little bit to fall back in love because if I approach it as like, okay, I got to do the next section and I feel like I'm slogging to the salt mines to write this beautiful story. Like that's not, <laughs> that's not the right feeling. I agree with you. And sometimes it starts good. And then I, I, I learned a lot over this last year. I mean, I, I didn't even know what the word panster meant. And <laughs> Ooh, are, are you a panster? Are you a hockey know. panster? I'm an, I, I've coined myself an Audi panster. <laughs> I like to make up the, just rando words. And that one's a good one because I'll outline and I'll panster it. I have book, I, I have journals all over my house and I, I'll use like, just the normal way you write a journal from you know, left to right, like you would in any book you read. I'll start there on one story, but then I'll flip the darn journal over and just start writing on the back half, the other one. And I, I, anytime I think of something, I'll just write it down. And sometimes I have to do the outline because I just get so much stuff in my brain and I don't know where I'm going, but Panster's fun. Although Panster can get you in trouble. I, I'm reading my book. I'm going, where the hell did I come up with seven? Seven years? It's eight years. We said eight years like 16 times. Where the hell did I put seven? I don't know that that's a, a problem of pantsing so much as sometimes it's just these small little details that, that really comes out a lot in editing. So, yeah, that's true. That's yeah, really I mean, true. you didn't accidentally change the name of one of your characters halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> that, may, that may have been done once or twice here or there. <laughs> yeah. I was writing, I'm writing another book, or I was. I put it on the shelf for a while, and and her name is Rochelle. One of my my characters is Rochelle. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Rachel. There's that's a third book, by the way, the Rochelle. That's probably never getting done. But Rachel was in. I, I literally just got done writing for Rachel, and I had to do some editing of, of Allie's stuff. And so I was reading through it, and I, I instead of Janelle, I put Rachel. And I didn't catch it. Usually, <laughs> that's so what the editor said. Who the hell is Rachel? It's it's like the four eyes process, only better. So tell us your whole problem, your process. Did you have beta readers, or was it just kind of you and Allie, or what is the greater committee involvement that made this happen? I, was, I, I had this grand idea of having beta readers, uh, and I didn't. Um, I did give Jill, you probably know Jill Jeannie from Pandora. I gave her first sex scene chapter, but that was it because I didn't want her to know anything about the story beyond what she feels right now, because I personally feel sex scenes to draw you in really hard. You don't need to know what's going on. You just have a prurient response. And then you really feel it when you know what's going on because you've read the story. So I just wanted to see how it punched her. It was interesting to get some feedback on it. It was really cool, but I wasn't ready for feedback yet. Like 99% of everything she told me was great. And the 1% I fixated on. So I clearly wasn't ready at that point. So I gave myself a break and Allie and I were our own editors. We just read lines and, and sent them back and forth. And then I, I tried to get my wife to read some of it and she doesn't like romance novels, so she wouldn't. And so finally, I just said, you know what? We're just going to write this thing. Allie is, is happy with where we are. Stop getting your own damn head and just go have fun with the damn thing. It, it, you don't owe anybody anything. Just go have fun. Yeah. And so I did. And then we went, then we, when we finished it, it went to the editor. And that was the first time somebody that I don't know has ever saw it. And it was scary as hell. I feel like there's an old quote about goalies that, you know, half the game is mental and the other half is being mental. It definitely <laughs> applies to authors. God, that's so true. My goal is that in my life of playing hockey, I can't tell you how many tires I've pumped up just to keep my goalie sane. Wow. <laughs> exactly. So there's the, you're an outlining pantser. Um, you did work with, was it a professional editor with the uh, publisher or was it, did you go out and find and pay a, another editor? Well, that, uh, once Allie submitted it, and I was pretty sure we were going to get picked up because just because of Allie, right, she right. has such great coattails, but you know, it still was that little bit that, well, if they don't like it, they're not going to pick it up. So once I got the work, they picked it up and, and peeled myself off the ceiling and, and tried to get my heart rate down. Cause I'm going bananas. Um, then they walked me through the process and we had an edit. We had two beta readers from them with their own little edits. And then it went to uh, the official editor and then we got her comments back and then it went to the proof editor. And after that, that, that was it. And then it was off for, for publishing. And that, that process took about four, 
Yeah, about four months because we just finished it up last month. Right. That is amazing. I mean, it's that's kind of a dream of so many authors of being able to write something and immediately turn around. And yeah, the having the coattails is incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and there's that little expression. It's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> and it's so true. I've, I've read so many articles with some statistics that make it make you never want to write because what's the chance? One to two percent. You're never going to get picked up by a publisher. That's what they tell you. But that's not true. You, there are so many publishers out there that are just looking for good work. And even if you're not down for that publisher or, or you get some, some bad feedback or you don't like the editor, you can always self-publish. Writing is... It, in this day and age is a gift. We have all the power because if we don't like the contract, you don't like the royalties, you don't like the editors, you don't like how they're treating you, shit, out. <laughs> Go do your own thing. <laughs> and as Wayne Gretzky said, you'll miss 100% of the shots you don't take. You got it. I think I've said that one many a time. That is absolutely <laughs> true. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter how crappy your shots are, just keep throwing them, they'll get better. Do you, <laughs> do you feel that as this has gone on, is writing the second one that you've started, is it easier or is it a little bit harder because now you know more? It, that's a great question. At times it feels like it's easier, but there are other times where you sit there and you see the cursor just blinking at you because what, what you want to say isn't coming through the fingers. And so you feel like you're just, you suck again. But then all of a sudden, when you're laying down to go to bed, everything just comes flooding out again. So it's all still there. Now, I wish I could take whatever's flooding when I'm like falling asleep and just like save it to like get up in the morning. But it reminds me that, you know what, even if you only remember five or 10 percent of this, it's all there. Stop putting so much pressure on yourself. And you know what else helps? A glass of wine. Holy crap. Let's loosen up a little. Now, I, I want to go back to that uh, delicious bit of saltiness you hinted at. And I want a little bit more. Tell us the difference. I mean, in writing a lesbian erotica, I have tons of opinions of watching when I see lesbian erotica on a TV or in a show or something. And I'm like, oh, that was definitely directed by a guy because that's not how lesbians make out. And, and like lesbians, I've never seen two lesbians grab each other's faces and go in for the kiss. That's that's just not in real life. You see in it real TV life, it's on TV, but it's not in real life. So. What did you do when you came to the romance part? The, my goodness, I find you fascinating. I love how you don't wear a bra. Sorry, I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you block it differently? What did you, how did you approach it that made it say, this is what you wanted to be reading? I have had the same issues that you've had, Jeannie, watching some of the best movies that, that you can watch and then they pull up some random lesbian sex scene just to throw it out there and say oh that's for a guy that's not for me i see that quite a bit and, and same thing happens as i said earlier with with some of the more mainstream books it's difficult to to relate to those characters but what isn't difficult to relate to in, in all aspects of romance is the romance part itself right. that should be organic and it should, it should flow from the personality that you are. And I used a lot of my own experiences, not just my own, but my experiences with my friends who have had you know, similar you know, encounters as I've had. So in terms of the romance, it's pretty straightforward. If, you, if you're attracted to somebody, you love somebody, you fall in love with somebody, you pursue it. The sex scenes were hard. That is hard because... I'm trying to think in my mind, does this work? Does this work? And you, I find my arms going around myself and like just doing random things to myself that if anybody walking by would think I'm absolutely batshit crazy. Totally in the world of, in the world of work from home that we've all been in for the last 18 months, I imagine you saying, it's oh, got honey, help. honey, come here for a second. Let me see if something works. <laughs> Um, Lisa, Lisa is my wife and she likes to say whenever uh, we talk about the sex scenes she always posts underneath anything I say about it this is not me these are not me yeah. I, doth, what's the expression thou doth protest too much yeah. <laughs> well I always figure um, sometimes it's even just the blocking like yeah. if the first thing that happened is somebody swept all the pillows off the bed and then you know, about, uh, let's just say a page and a half later, you have somebody biting a pillow. I've often thrown out of the scene, wait, how did a pillow get back on the bed? I mean, yes. it seems like a strange thing to talk about blocking that way, but but it matters. It really does. Continuity it really matters. matters. Yeah. I'm sorry, John, go ahead. Continuity matters. But what did yes, you say? And, 
and, and editors are fantastic to catch that. And uh, <laughs> it's like, uh, excuse me, you need to pick the pillow up again before you start biting it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, you know, when it comes to the women you know, making love, having sex, fucking whatever you're, whatever you're using as that part of your uh, script at that point, part of your story, it's important to capture what the emotion you want. So there's a big difference between making love and fucking. And there is. And when you're writing, when, when I read lesbian romance novels or, or just lesbic in general, when someone says making love and then you see some really hardcore stuff, I'm not sure that that fits. And the flip side, if you're doing the hardcore, but you're calling it making love, it kind of just in my own mind, it's like, ooh, that's a little bit dramatic for a first encounter. <laughs> and so I, I tend to just let it flow with the personality of the character. These two particular characters, as you'll find, there's a lot of, of emotion in every touch, no matter what. And even if it's fun and sex, it's a fun sex scene, there's always that undercurrent of true emotion. And that's how I approached every scene with Janelle and Alex. I, I think that's the wise is to lead, lead by character and lead by emotion. And then once you get the, have editors to clean up your blocking a little bit, but. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty happy they didn't have a lot of issues with the blocking. Um, and it's probably because I was so worried about that particular scene that uh, I read it over and over and over again. And I, I had to do several rewrites of it to tone it down or, or bring it up. And, and just for the, the continuity issues, I found a couple and I, I didn't see them the first three times. So mm -hmm. reading it over and over again was really great. Oh, it, what was weird about it, though, is I'm reading this very hot sex scene. And for me, it's like now I know what actors feel like. It's so clinical. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make this look good, although right now I'm thinking, OK, you're in Burger King for lunch soon. <laughs> now, there's another bit of blocking that I look forward to as well, and that's the blocking of the hockey playing, yeah. because I have run into like I enjoyed Devin Monk's hockey books, which makes me think that Devin maybe plays hockey or is a big old fan. I don't know. But I compare to things that we saw in hockey movies like. Do you remember the flying wing from the Mighty Ducks and that everybody <laughs> yes, the blind hockey is like. Oh no. That's oh, not oh, oh no. <laughs> this no. is not football. This is not soccer. This is not rugby. And I I look forward to seeing how you used, I mean, clearly some hockey and direction if it's in an NHL, maybe. Are there is there any other private? Do you do you go deeply into watching the hockey and descriptions? But there will be no flying V's. That, that, <laughs> that, is, we appreciate that is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And sometimes the LA Kings, who are my team, they do that on the power play. And I just want to throw my, my remote control through the wall. I think they just do it because of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> they get 50 bucks if they do it again. I bet that's it. And, and free burgers. I thought I got, I hope not. <laughs> but with hockey, it's really interesting you said that because the first person that read the book had never watched a hockey game. And so she had to look up terms like deek, three on two, even though it's basic, but you, you don't know what it means in this in a in a hockey sense and I mean line changes, et cetera. So we decided chirping. to people don't understand they're chirping all along the bench, like <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> right. Uh, we, there is a glossary in there because oh, I I'm a hockey player. I can't I can't dumb it down any further than I did because I understand other people may not watch hockey, but it's important to me to be to be accurate with that. So, yeah, you know, a one two two, that's a, a formation for a, a hockey team versus another team in a defensive end, and a, and a two one two. Those are two different types of, of hockey play, and I ended up using that in the book. It was a really important part of the book, so I ended up actually even defining that. I defined checking. I defined hooking, holding. Things that that will make it flow a little bit better, even chiclets, even the term <laughs> chiclets. So it, it it was important for me to be as organic with the story and as true to hockey as I possibly could. Now, my wife pointed something out to me yesterday and it just I, I normally wouldn't share this, but I have to because we're all hockey players here. So we'll appreciate it. Part of the book, I use the term ref to break up a fight ref she goes christy lines can break up the fights not the refs i go i know <laughs> but i can't put that in there because who i didn't want to put linesman in there either it's just so much just bogged down on the reader so there were some liberties that had to be taken just to keep the story flowing it does and, and it players, could be that 
that people have only ever maybe been to their kids game or played one and like there's only two refs on the ice what are you talking about so well, you know, I, I, said, I think yeah. that one could fly it, it's just so funny that she caught that like that's what you caught out of all of that that's <laughs> everything you just read you caught that <laughs> Well, it, it is a true thing, though, that when you read something, if it's in your area of expertise and they get it way wrong, you either have to deliberately suspend a bunch of disbelief yeah. or you just say, OK, I'm planet hockey. <laughs> right. It, I mean, you're a lawyer. Much. Have you ever watched the show Boston Legal? <laughs> I have not. I, ha I actually don't watch a lot of legal shows. I mean, you shouldn't. You would or, not like it. <laughs> uh, or you might, but you have to suspend much the way that physicists have challenges watching Star Trek or, you know, or any other science fiction. It's it's a it's kind of a beautiful bromance in its own way. But, you know. Yeah, but the legal stuff. Oh, God. Like next yeah. time I hear someone say objection sustained, I'm, I, I just want to pull my hair out because you can't just say objection. Well, why, what are you objecting about? Yeah, yeah. Be specific. <laughs> right. It's just stupid little things like that. Or when when a, a lawyer comes up right up to a, a person that's a, that's a witness on the uh, that's being questioned and they're just in their face and that, that stuff doesn't happen. I can't watch yeah. it. I, I would love to watch it, but I can't because my brain won't turn off. <laughs> <laughs> well, watch episode one to see, you know, there's some great one liners. And if you can't take it, it won't be for you. But it's got really funny one liners. <laughs> Boston Legal? Is that what you yeah. said? Boston yeah. Legal. The partner walks in without wearing his uh, pants. And <laughs> one guy, Alan Shore looks at it. Is it casual Monday? <laughs> God, that's great. I just wrote it down. <laughs> Get it, Jay. And so what do you, for the next one, is it going to be a sequel to this or? Yeah, I decided to, to write a sequel. There's one particular character that you'll meet in the book. Her name is Brandy and she's uh, Janelle's best friend. And she's been Janelle's best, best friend since they played ice hockey uh, in Canada. And so she's a funny character in the book. I really loved her. There's a lot of quirks and, and, and quips that she likes to say in there. I like doing that myself. I used to joke around and, and say I had, there's a, there's a book of Christianity and yes, I know, but that's, I give my name away, but that's okay. Because I always come up with just some rando thing and it gets thrown in some rando definition that Christy has. It's just some Christyism. And so she has her own. She has several of her own and she keeps Janelle, you know, she keeps her really grounded, but at the same time, she lets Janelle fly. And I loved her so much that I wanted to write a book about her, surrounding her. And there's another character in the book who you only meet in chapter two. She is profound in this book and she is horrible. She's going to be the other MC in the next book. I've decided I want to go ahead and rehabilitate her and turn her into a great person because I mashed together, not just this, but I think I can do it. But the really bad character, I've mashed two of my best friend's name together in that. Well, <laughs> and, and one would like to redeem one's best friends after all. Yeah. So I told him the other day, I go, don't worry. You're, you're, you're a, you're a real bitch in the, in this book, but I, I I'm going to save you. I promise I'll save you. So it gets I'm looking better. forward to that one. Hmm? It gets better. Yeah, it gets better. There you go. That one will be a little bit different. And uh, Alex and Janelle will still be part of the story. They're going to be integral part of the story, but they're going to be the secondary part of the story where we explore Brandy and that particular character their relationship, which is just a spoiler alert, they hate each other. Well, fair. <laughs> what advice would you give if somebody said, you know, I want to read something that represents me and that I feel represents, I should write something. What advice would you give that person? My advice is go for it. There is no, the moment you put a word on the paper, which, or Microsoft Word or whatever you want to use, the moment you do that, you're a writer. So you can get over that hump. It's done. You did it. You've done right there more than most people will ever do in their entire lives. So just keep writing. Just write and see where it goes. There's nothing holding you back but you. If you find people that just continuously poo-poo you and, and, and put you down and think that it's just a pipe dream, that's a them problem not a you problem. And don't make it a you problem. You are the only person that has to live with yourself every minute of every day. And if this makes you happy, do it. If you're ever published, great. If, you, if you're published by a publisher, even better if that's what you choose. But you are the master of your own destiny. And all you have to do is write it. That's it. And somewhere out there, I think you're going to make somebody's life better or happier or brighter. Even if it's just one person, 
even if that person was you, you know? That's actually kind of one of the reasons why I did this. A, yeah. a big reason was that I've always limited myself on things that made me put myself out there other than being a lawyer. That's a different me. That's, that's my armor. Player, because, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, yes, you're not always you on the ice. It's like a Snickers commercial. <laughs> yeah, I can be a, a, a bit of a, a person on the ice. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Um, bravado is fantastic, but when you're stripping it down bare and you're writing, if you leave the bravado alone and just write, just write what you want. Even if you're your only audience, you've done it. Don't let anybody ever tell you you can't do it. If they're the ones saying that you, yeah, you can't do it, what we have, we have a big pandemic in this country of projection. They project their own insecurities onto you. Don't take them. You got enough baggage to deal with. Put those aside and just keep on moving. And you made me think of one other thing that we haven't quite said of there's many people that said to themselves, I shall write a book if I ever had the time. And then <laughs> in this last year, maybe they found out that time wasn't the reason. Yeah. But once you start, I like how you how you expressed that once you start, it's easier to keep going. But the hard part is getting started and put a few words down, maybe a hundred a day, maybe 50, but something. And forgive yeah. yourself when you just want to lie in bed and, and doom scroll all day, because that's okay too. But don't do it too much. <laughs> you know, that's like uh, doom scrolling is, uh, is one of the things I do far too much. So when I find <laughs> myself doom scrolling too much, I'll, I'll actually force myself to sit down and write. That's one of the only times I force myself. Uh, but in terms of not having time, and that's actually... It, it, there's an expression that I use. Excuses are like assholes. Everyone has one that all full of crap. That's very yeah. crass. I get it. But it stays in your head. So you have to decide, is this an excuse or is it a reason? If you find that you don't have enough time and if it's that important to you, I promise you, you'll make the time. That's just another excuse for your brain to protect you from fear of failure by saying, oh, you just don't have time. So why would you start? If every person that's ever worked out had that philosophy, which many of us do, you never step foot in the gym. Anything that's hard is going to take time and you have to find it. Exactly. But it's the what comes out at the end of it, you know, going to the gym, learning to play hockey, uh, writing a book. All of these things carry their own intrinsic challenges and their own intrinsic rewards. They really do. And one other thing that I know that a, a lot of writers have an issue with is just the, what to use to write. Like what They get caught up in the semantics of what's appropriate. If you're better off, just if you find something in your brain that, that you want to write about, if you all you have is your phone to speak into, speak into it. That you have so many ways to get your story out for your, for you to be able to bring it all together at the end and make it the product that you want. There's no rule. You do what you want. That's there the good there's, writing. there's voice to text programs and you, you're exactly right. So this is reminding everyone, absolutely hat trick is her new book. It's going to be out October 1st of 2021 through, is it, do I have it right? Affinity Rainbow Publications. Yes. Ra uh, Affinity Rainbow Publications. You got it. We will put all the pertinent links to all of these things, uh, including maybe some terms and glossaries that we mentioned on our website, which is www.writersdrinkingcoffee.com. You can also find us on Facebook or Twitter. We answer email. Uh, KL, they, can they reach out to you on your own website? Absolutely. You can find me at klgallagher.com. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all by the same uh, moniker, KL Gallagher. And you can sign up for my newsletter. If you sign up for my newsletter by September 30th, you will automatically be entered into uh, the opportunity to get a autographed copy of the book. So I'm really looking forward to that. We, we need to sell about 250 to get those printed <laughs> copies. So let's do it, ladies. Let's see what we can do. All right. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. It was great talking to you. You've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main web support magic is brought to you by Deirdre Schween, and our sound engineer and backup web spider is David Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Made Milking Cow, and our exit music is Breakfast with a Morning Person, both by Michael Langberg. You can hear more from Michael Langberg on manyhatsmusic.com. Our podcast t-shirts along with our hockey jerseys, are both designed by Jackal Designs, who allows you to buy cool WDC swag, especially celebration of our 100th episode. And hey, 
Thanks so much for listening.